Oh, well, we can get it going, though. Yeah. We're just kind of respect for everybody's time. Does everybody have the minutes for a while? Last meeting. Yes, I move approval. Second. The number. All right, uh, meeting on the second. At this time, is there any further discussion? None. Call for a vote. Maybe we need roll call. No, we don't. So just do a vote out here. All those in favor of accepting the minutes, say aye, please. Aye. aye. Any opposed? Any no oppositions? The motion passes. Uh, Hey Eric, this is John Strange from the uh, Boards, Commissions, and Committee Subcommittee meeting. And hey, we're, we're live and, uh, and going. Right on. Hey everybody. Hi Hello. Eric. Hi Eric. All right, right now we are at public comment. Uh, do we do have one more strength. Yeah. registrant, um, okay. Grant Foster, and if you suspend the rules, we get this. Uh, Move suspension of the rules to stand informally and allow for public discussion and engagement on any agenda item. Right. All right, we have a second. Are uh, any further discussion on the motion presented by Alice Kimball? Hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? In no opposition, that motion passes. And uh, our guests and folks who have taken time out of their day away from their families and loved ones and gardens and everything, you guys are now welcome to. Join in, ask questions uh, as you see fit. So welcome, thank you all. Uh, yeah, so yeah, sure. If you had something to say, I mean, we should probably give it that to myself real quick. Those are me. So sure. I'm Lance Grant, uh, and I uh, was on the Pet Bike Motor Vehicle Commission for three years, as well as the Long Range Transportation and Planning Committee. And um, I'm pretty aware and involved in sort of city governance, and interested in the work happening here. Uh, I followed along pretty well in the first few meetings that were kind of available to listen to or watch remotely and haven't, um, not sure exactly what's kind of happened over the last several, but I'm here today and just want to listen and maybe I'll have some comments uh, on things we're talking about later. Well, we're looking for some answers. All right. Well, well I've got some answers. Too. Yep. <laughs> I'm no sweat. Uh, but yeah, so thank you for coming yeah. to everybody here. Uh, thank you all for coming out. Just do you know Roger Goodwin? I do. Okay. It turns right. out. Good. All right. It's <laughs> Madison. You're here long enough. You know everybody. Yeah. <laughs> and you just go to Woodman's. You know, That's just <laughs> your dad and I had our pictures on the front page of the State Journal sports page last week. Did you notice that? No. We were both at the East La Follett oh. basketball game. He was sitting behind me. We were faces in the crowd as that guy hit the three right in front of us to win the game. <laughs> Yes, East is number one and undefeated. Which is what's important here. All right, uh, at this time, disclosures and recusals. Does anyone have any disclosures and recusals at this time? Uh, none. We're trying to get into our work. I do want to say Happy New Year. Uh, hopefully, everyone had a chance to reflect. I think a lot about you guys because that's how exciting the guy I am. But I do appreciate uh, everybody here, the commitment to this work, to our distinguished staff member. I have to do about 12 30. Got it. So, uh, yeah, again, so we got a couple more meetings on the books. This is this correct? I think we have two more. Did we set those? I thought we did before we broke for the new year. Um, we'll talk about that because I think we're at this point where we can start negotiating some of these alternative structures and just kind of looking at what that would look like. And I think one thing that I'm hoping that we'll get out of that is that we'll start to see... Um, I, will, I hope that it illuminates some of the challenges that we have currently because a lot of our alternatives when we start presenting them are going to present, you know, they're wicked problems. So a lot of these things are going to present their own challenges and limitations such as the one we just kind of briefly were talking about which is having meetings at different places to accommodate some folks it means you're going to miss other folks and this is kind of what we ran into at the time. Um, I thought there were two more. I think you're right. It's on the books and January 17th on my calendar. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay. I'm looking for one after that. That would have been either bi weekly. Yeah, that's good. <coughs> that could be the last one. That would be I think that's a 
Okay, so again, the goal here is to get this, the final write-up of this work that we've been doing over the last couple of months to the full committee by, do we say March 1st or March? Uh, it's vaguely stated as March. Yeah. It's not well, March 1st. Vaguely stated. Yeah. Yeah. Two meetings in March. Well, March 1st is in March. So, yeah, so ideally we get it there by March 1st. Um, and so uh, I kind of want to open this up to the three of you. You know, I'll just be here and take notes uh, just so that I get my record of it. Uh, because what we, we talk about right now is a lot of the, the potential ways to mitigate some of the challenges that we have brought up. Hopefully everyone remembers all of the challenges that we brought up. It was a long time ago. And then, uh, well, first, I mean, that's on the agenda. I mean, did everybody get a chance to read the uh, the report back that we have to do? Yeah. Yes. Um, that's it, John. Passed out. Is that on the? It's the. It's the next item. Um. I mean, we have Robert's rules suspended, so I guess I could just ask to you guys: Would you folks mind talking about that real quick? Then we can spend the remainder of the time uh, going over. Who do we take up item six? Second. Okay. All right. Let's do it. We have a motion to second it. Any further discussion? All right. All those in favor of moving item six up to number five, say aye. 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 All right. Motion passed. Any opposed? Hearing no opposition. And, Eric, and say maybe, something. Maybe for, I was just going to say for I Eric, it refer to your email, Eric, that, um, that, that, that John sent. Was that yesterday, John? Uh, yes. That he sent us a copy of this document electronically yesterday that we'll be discussing. I got it. All right, so uh, we can just kind of jump into it. And I'll, like I said, I'll try and uh, work directly on this. I can work directly on the document and send it out to the group, right? That's fine. All right. Uh, I will do that. If anyone has any questions or uh, comments or if there's stuff that's missing, I did. I got this from John. I was. Uh, I didn't want to make any things, and I kind of wanted to wait until we got the group together to see if there was stuff that we uh, should be adding or deleting or addressing. question that I, well, any other comments on this? I have a few things. I guess, um, on the number, f item number four, uh, with the, the g subcommittee generally agreed. Um, there is a lot more nuance and conditions to some of the general agreement on these items, especially I think uh, number one, and I—I I mean, first of all, thank you so much, John, for putting this together because I mean it was a chaotic and large amount of information to to kind of shoehorn into this. So I, I I'm in no way please take this as a criticism of you, but I I just Rich, think that really having, I just think that that having um, some of. I mean, and they're not going to, the nuances of our discussions and our, you know, general agreement are not going to be captured in a document like this. So I, I guess I just want to make sure that when we do the actual report, that we are able to speak to some of those things, uh, right? Instead of having just a transcript of all the meetings. Yeah, um, no, uh, so that, if you want to list a couple, of, just so we jot them down about the areas in each one of these, I don't mind. Uh, so um, yeah, we have two hours, we're going to have to use the whole thing. Uh, city attorney said he does have to take off a little bit early. Yeah. But, uh, got the system. I know. Then we got to do it. 
this guy. No, but yeah, uh, you know, let's spend some time on this. I don't know if there's anything. But from the standpoint of what, uh, let me just say what, what Eileen had told me, and I don't know what she told other people, but she wanted a bullet point type of report, not a, an extensive yeah. narrative at this point. So from the standpoint of approving the, this as a, as a preliminary report, we should, I think, keep that in mind. But I think your point about, you know, when we get to writing the, the final report, we're going to want to be more complete. I have a, I have a comment on, can y'all hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking at, are we, are we making comments about this document now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm looking at number five um, and discussing the alternatives to address some of the challenges. And one of the issues that we talked about was the lack of, um, lack of accountability and authority of the committees. Um, and we explored a potential solution being to have um, more power, more uh, decision-making authority in these committees so that the public engagement that's happening um, is actually honored in a real way and therefore valued um, and incentivizes participation that way. I, I don't really see that called out explicitly except for reorganize the structure to increase accountability and require annual review, but it, it doesn't really explicitly talk about elevating the um, authority of the committee. That might be something that we really want to call out specifically. Uh, Eric, I saw, I, I just want so like I had an observation, I just want to make sure that it's, because I'm trying to break this all down. One of the things that I thought we addressed was the variance of authorities within the different commu uh, committees, commissions, and boards. Yeah. So it wasn't just that they don't have authority, it's that the, whether it's de facto or some have by yeah. uh, mandate, some of them have different, you know, there's a variance in terms of this decision making. Is that the same thing? Uh, no, that's different. I think that that's a, that talks about, um, the, it's, I think it's related. Um, and I, what I, if I'm if summary shows you correctly, um, we talked about the need to codify um, that decision making authority and really um, make sure that the participation of these committees goes beyond just the recommendation. Well, okay, let's talk about that because I also, I mean, the challenge that I have with that is that I felt like some of them, I thought we talked about some of them being having. They're not elected officials, and so a lot of these things, at the end of the day, when we're looking at representation and uh, the, what we're saying is the veneer of representation versus actual representation, is that you're giving a lot of authority to very small segments of the entire city to make decisions that affect other parts of the city, uh, and that they have too much ability to do that. And so it wasn't about codifying that, it was asking the question as to why. And, uh, for example, and it was loosely or tangentially associated with what our topic was, but the conversation we had about, I don't know, it was like one of the ones that we had at the municipal building, but we were saying like, neighbor association, somehow they have a uh, review ability and the city listens to them, but there is no regulation or oversight as to how they do elections or to representation or anything about these things. So you have this, how do these guys get to have a uh, say over what happens in the city when they how do we regulate who's in a neighborhood association so that was what we were saying but somehow they have authority that was the example i remember got brought up and then we looked at the way that some of the committees operate but uh i think what eric is touching on is one of the one of the uh, i think at least one or more of the people who addressed this who served on committees felt that, that one of the problems of recruiting people is that they get on a committee and the committee can't do anything and that more authority given to committees would encourage more people to participate. Is, is that kind of what you're talking about, Eric? Um, sort of. It's, it's basically the problems that we're seeing are are sort of um, exacerbated by each other. So the lack of decision-making authority is an issue, but increasing decision-making authority is also an issue because of the lack of participation. So, but if there's a increase in representative participation and a true requirement of representative participation based on the issues that are being addressed, then 
there should be more decision making authority because without that, we're just kind of canceling itself out if it moves to a less representative decision making body. Does that make sense? Uh, I mean, I hear what you're saying. I don't know how to capture that. In a, yeah, uh, Alder Campbell. I think a fundam the fundamental question that. Um, is uh, beneath what you're saying, Eric, and beneath what you are saying, Justice, is a basic lack of clarity about what kind of authority the different boards, commissions, and committees have. So that's like a, the underlying issue is that clarity. Um, and with that, without clarity, the, you can't really have intention around around uh, around those things so another kind of related piece and one of the pieces that I didn't um, see here was a discussion about and it maybe has to do with the general agreement that there's too many committees and and for me it wasn't just that there it wasn't that there are too many committees it, that it's that there are too many committees that don't understand their purpose and don't understand their authority and in that, in that regard we talked about eliminating standing committees and having a more robust system of ad hoc committees with a very clearly defined scope of work and purpose and I don't I don't see that um, I would like to have that captured so real here quick. With that. sir so I, I tried to get at this through four, three, um, and I used the word jurisdiction instead of authority. That may have been a, maybe throwing people. Um, but maybe you could tweak that one to get it even closer to what you're trying to say, but that's that's kind of where um, I was trying to get that point across. Yeah. And, then, and then springing into five, um, it was the bullet that talks about providing better clarity of purpose that could yeah. be also be tweaked to include, to specifically call out levels of authority. Um, yeah, so that's what I thought we talked about. I feel I like think at, last, those were the at our last meeting here, I thought that's yeah. what we discussed. Yeah. I, I is that a lot of the challenge short? But this short. notion of standing versus ad hoc, is, I think that's a substantial something that came out of this committee that's not necessarily reflected. Well, the okay. So where I thought we covered this in these bullets, and again, I'm not married or in love with this document either. But the, uh, I mean, I didn't mean to say it that way. You meant to I meant to say, you appreciate. I'm not averse to changing it and improving on the brilliance that was given to us. It's a better way to say that. No, uh, my apologies. Uh, I'm well past that point. I think I heard for the drafter of this document. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but uh, so we talked about what uh, Alder Kimball said in terms of um, direction and accountability as I thought where we were going with that is that in terms of how, what are the deliverables, how are these things defined? So it's very difficult to find the policy that aside from the legislation that creates them, there's not a whole lot in terms of what is ex expected and how they're going to be evaluated over time. Sir. Yeah, I just I think in addition to the question of clarity, what I heard from Eric was the importance of uh, authority as a sort of motivating factor for people to put the time and energy in. And then what I heard from you, Justice, was sort of the, the concern of if they're not elected, then you know, should they have authority or what authority should they have? And I think maybe another way to look at it would be to dis distinguish between authority and influence. And so perhaps if there were clarity around the influence that a group had, it could still be a motivating factor for participation, that you know that the work you're putting in will, will be seriously considered and that could, could lead to change without necessarily being authority and sort of taking that from council or staff. So, Mr. Upchurch, uh, how, how's all this sitting with you? I think that there's this need to... Um that there's a need for us to understand the authority, but understanding the authority also isn't, um, it comes second to the, I, I, I can't say that it comes second, but it's not the same as having actual authority. Um, and those that there's a need for us to have that actual authority between commissions and committees if they are actually representative and those things can't be exclusive. Okay. For for the purposes of the update um, that we were going to send to Eileen, hopefully 
in short order after this meeting, uh, just because she just wants an update, a status update. Sit right. Uh, well, this is actually something that will be done on the 16th. Right. The actual full at our at our. So you. No, right. No, yeah, yeah. but I, no, no, no. That's next Thursday, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. So. Um, when? So between now and next Thursday, we should, you know, we do want to. So when I do the. Uh, it's, it's the 16th. It's less than the 17th, more than the 15th. 16th is a Wednesday. So next Wednesday, um, this is the report back that I got to give, but I want to make sure. We want to make sure that this is as accurate. So I just try to think uh, if there's a way. Because. I, well, maybe, the question is, is it captured in some of these other areas? Well, I don't think it is. And what the way Eric just phrased it about the... Because um, this is a political question that people with different ideologies are going to fall one way or the other on. Um, and But I think posing it as a question of um, do these resident boards, commissions, and committees, like authority and accountability, they're, they're so, they're so tied to get, it's such a, uh, you can't take one away from the other when, um, when, when we debate this issue. So what, uh, what, what I heard Eric say was that he believes committees should have power to actually make decisions, but only if they are somehow certified as representative of the community, which is a, a a hard nut to crack. So I think somehow that that is something that is better done with each more modes of participation. With what? Different modes, different modes of participation. Modes of participation. <laughs> so so, and, and uh, this is something else I think we've discussed was that boards, commissions, and committees aren't, this is not like the public participation committee. This is boards, commissions, and committees. And th something I think we have acknowledged is that in addition to this very formal structure that feeds into a representative democratic uh, decision making body uh, that's in, you know, uh, uh, authorized by statute. There are a lot of other ways in which um, representation and participation can happen uh, in in the city, um, but we're not dealing with all of those ways in this committee. Is okay. that fair to say that? And I think that's something the whole task force is is going to. Do. No, I mean, I, yes, sir. Um, two things. Since I wasn't at your last meeting, I'm sort of gathering what you're saying here, and I hear a few things. First, I, I hear the, the issue of ad hoc against standing committees you would like to see with someone on this report. Um, that the committees need to be representative of the community, and that you have a sort of a, a, a wide variety of power and influence among committees and a need to empower the committees. Those are things I heard. The question I have is when you say you want to empower the committees or give them more authority, do you mean authority to take action without any resort to the common council? Is, it, is that what you mean when you say it or do you mean? Uh, that's a good question. I mean, this is, I have different thoughts on this. I mean, but, uh, you know, I want to make sure that this is, I'm fine with the consensus thing and trying to get, you know, trying to, to get there. I mean, I understand everything we're saying. They should be more representative and if they were more representative, they should have more ability to make decisions. I understand that as a rhetorical device. Politically, I'm curious about how that happens because what we have right now is a monstrosity that, in theory, you could have thousands of representat you know, representatives across the city that are butchers, bakers, candlestick makers involved in many different decisions, and it sounds great. What we're actually seeing, though, is the concentration of power is, or the, the, the overwhelming representation is concentrated into a very small number of aldermanic districts, and it is not diverse at all. And so in the structure that we have right now, in, and the, my understanding of the current structure is that some, you know, pigs are more equal than others. And so there are a few of these committees that, and I think they make no qualms about it. And when we had our guest from the mayor's office uh, joined us for this meeting, she named, and we kind of, and I think with uh, Mr. Rothschild's muse, I think we captured kind of the gist of that, which is we have your alpha 
committees that make no qualms about their authority to make decisions. Those are mostly commissions. Too. Public works, is that a commission? Because what she's, I mean, we, we know what they are, parks, it's public board. commissions. Boards and commissions tend to have their own. Plan commission, yeah. finance committee. I mean, but the point is, is that we understand that those, in terms of the authority of those to actually make policy or their feelings about that is, we understand that those, whereas when you start getting into a lot of these other ones, whether or not they do, and then to Eric's point is maybe part of the challenge that we have in terms of filling them, a lot of these other committees, because we went through and we had that number of vacancies, it's a lot, um, is that they, and I'm talking loud just so Eric can hear me, sorry, I also always talk loud, but, uh, but the idea though is that we don't, people are not running out to join these committees so that I can sit around, you know, figure out childcare, I can take the two hour bus from the north side to downtown to come in here and talk for an hour about something that may or may not ever see the light of day. And that was also brought up, was it here we were talking about the three minute thing? That was a council thing. Remember we were saying, why would you take a bus yeah. across town, get childcare to come in here and talk for three minutes? Yeah. And no one in the, well, the council is like looking at their phone and scratching their feet. <coughs> okay, so. Uh, um, one of the things that I thought in terms of defining a, a, accountability for, I'll call them subcommittees, and having a committee that was responsible that consisted of a number of alders and a number of people, some of whom might come from those sub, subcommittees, I'm not sure of that, was that you develop a relationship then, and that with a relationship comes influence and respect. And so it works both ways. You know, you, if, you, if, you, if you believe that the subcommittee is doing a good job and it comes up to that committee, it not only serves as a filter about what goes to the committee and there's some interaction, but there's also some support that comes for that along with the respect that comes from that shared committee that's doing the work. So, I, I, you know, I just thought it, it, it's a way of not eliminating all these committees and uh, residents to participate, but it, but it does not count. That just a, provide accountability, but also a give and take as it comes up, so there's respect. And then I think authority comes from the respect, not authority to make final decisions, because I don't think the council's going to give that up on many of these issues. And, and this is where we, uh, the other question, the big question that I had was on, uh, and we're not done with this, Eric, at all, but the, uh, was the last point, which is we saw a number of things that had kind of a, whether it's reciprocal or symbiotic relationship with the council. And so that you, you can't really do much with this, or you can't look at this. I mean, you can. There are a number of things that we can address independently by looking at the uh, boards, commissions, committees structure. But it's hard to do that without thinking about what the council is, because some of the arguments that we heard is that we do have a form of public participation in government. It's called being an alder. And so you know, you can come out and you can become and you can run for alder, and that's representation, right? So. Uh, I don't know how we square that circle at the very, I mean, at the very end, because we have to, I think, as a whole committee, we have to revisit that stuff. And also on that um, topic, and uh, on the topic of how some committees are, have more power than others, this relates to the questions we need to address as a task force about the power of the mayor's office and the power of the council uh, having to do with appointment powers because who appoints? And also, not only who appoints members, but how do staff get assigned to committees? So let me just, something this week that uh, I noticed this week, at the Transportation Policy and Planning Board, we um, had two reports from basically ad hoc committees in front of us. One was from the ad hoc uh, committee on um, entertainment um, that was discussing uh, racial disparities and racial biases uh, in entertainment and in police. It, it actually turned out to be like a microcosm of a lot of the social issues we're dealing with. And one was a report from the, the, the uh, Oscar Mayer Strategic Assessment Committee. And when we, when we looked at those reports, it was clear that one of those committees had a lot more staffing support and a lot more uh, re city resources allocated to that work than the other. So these are things that I don't know if 
you know, that this goes back really to some of the non-structural but very present power dynamics in how committees function. And this is also true about, you know, just generally, I think, why some committees have more power at the council when it comes time to vote for the council is because activist alders are on those committees. And they do organizing within the committee, they do organizing within the council to elevate the recommendations of those committees, and others don't have active. Others have alders that are not as proactive in, in moving the recommendations of those committees forward. That's kind of, that's just a power question that I don't know will be addressed by changing any, any structure. And those, to me, are the biggest, like, are the biggest frustrations uh, when we're talking about power and representation and, and how that plays so out. So I'll get to, to Graham real quick, but uh, one thing that I did want, that we did talk about, uh, that I'm gonna, if people are okay with it, for three, we did talk about just for uh, appointment as being an issue, appointment of the committees alone, it was a point of contention, let's say. Right. Uh, it wasn't necessarily an issue, but it is a point of contention that also intersects both with the conversations we're having about the council and also about the mayoral. One of these That's exactly right, number six, yes, what city attorney, okay. yes. But in addition to that uh, was the question about staff and how staff are assigned, who, how, who gets to determine which staff are assigned to these committees and the degree of what that even means to have staff assigned because one thing that we did talk about was the amount of time, the amount of money this costs us as a city having staff who are uh, called out to go manage tree lane because we ignored 100 years of housing policy. And, uh, I mean, the staff had to have to go serve on these committees and commissions. Uh, so, yes, sir. Yeah, I was just going to offer an example. So when I was on a uh, Pentagon Motor Vehicle, there was a subcommittee formed for uh, looking at bicycle facility maintenance. And, you know, that ended up taking, I think it, it was about three years that that subcommittee uh, existed, even though it had a, a very specifically defined role. Um, I think the primary issue for me, so, so I was leading it for the second half and sort of brought it to a conclusion. There, there wasn't any training or support for me as, as sort of a leader of, of that body, so that's sort of one potential issue, but I think the primary one was the staffing of it, and the staffing was not clearly defined, and then when it was sort of assigned, um, it, it wasn't very effective, and so it led to so many sort of uh, canceled meetings, rescheduled, where were the minutes from the meeting, so I think having some standards around if, if and when there is going to be a body of whatever level, there needs to be some definition around what kind of support that is. And I would say broadly, if there's not enough support, then it probably shouldn't even exist because that, that was a big issue for that group. So, and I, I do want to circle back just to check in with uh, Mr. Upchurch, just because I know you're on the phone, it can be hard to, to get the voice, but real quick, um, we did kind of talk about this because there was this question about who actually, in some committees, there is very there are very active staff. Mm -hmm. who, you know, there's a few of them that I know that I don't care really who's on the committee. I know who I'm actually working with, which is the staff. And I need them more than I need the alders or the committee or anything else because in general, once they're on board and you're getting staff okay, mm -hmm. everything else is going to fall into place. Uh, whereas other ones, it sounds like the one that our uh, guest brought up, staff are kind of like, oh, by the, you know, like, there's this thing, and I got someone calling me asking for things. Who is this guy? You know, asking me to print stuff out. So there's, the story goes back, though, right now to a uh, lack of clarity as to how these things are formed, what they're, you know, how are we defining, who gets to define, but how are we defining and explaining what their mandate reach scope is, what type of decision making they actually have, and how we check back in, which I don't know. I mean, Eric, how you doing? Yeah, I'm, I'm with that, and I'll say it again, you know, um, it's those three things. We need the clarity, we need the accountability in terms of decision-making authority, and we need the representation that comes from uh, modes of participation. I, I think we're having more of a, um, a philosophical discussion, and I mean, if both are amenable to those, you know, agree that at least that we need those three things. I mean, those are, are potential alternatives that are, are coming from this discussion, then I think that 
something that we can add to this um, to, to keep things going. But I'm, 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 I'm hearing everything people are saying. It's a question for the city attorney, uh, city attorney's office, either of you. No, but uh, what's the rules about sending around documents with track changes, shared documents, how does that work? Can't do that. You can't do track changes? What you would, if, if you, I mean, you can either make the changes now or you tell the staff what it looks like. We can circulate it again and if people want to contact us individually and say, I don't like this change or that, you can do it. But you can't be sending it around to the whole committee and having everybody have a meeting on, online. So if we individually send it to John and he can send it back out and say, hey, this is what we got. And then we can individually send it back to him saying, actually, this is, but we can't converse about the thing. All right, we're going to do this here. Um, <laughs> great. No, I just want to make sure we capture this. And so, so, so to follow up on that appointment staffing, so the, <coughs> the second to last bullet on the first page says staffing. That could be. And I just, yeah, I put staff. appointment. That's what I put. A, responsibilities, <laughs> resource allocation. Well, uneven, uneven resources across committees, uneven okay. staffing across Staffing, committees. equity, staffing, yeah. uniformity. And also expectations. Staffing, uniformity. I also think there's something about resources because the task force on equity and music and entertainment wanted to have a website, like other committees had a website to deposit all of their resources and they were told no they couldn't do that. Um, there's also the question of what ends up in Legistar and how it ends up in Legistar because sometimes people the people can't find the stuff from the committee because it's not in Legistar. It's one of those additional meetings that's someplace else that you have to try to hunt down. So there like the resources and the availability of the materials for the meeting is a huge issue. Plus that committee also had a huge issue with they would ask staff from other departments to show up and they wouldn't show up. And so they're trying to do their work and the staff from the other departments aren't showing up. And then they get to the end and they're like, well, we can only accept this report because we didn't hear from the police department because the police department never showed up. So, I mean, there, it's, again, that's not structure though so much as it's about the expectations and the resources that are available to the committees. So, is, so that, is that Brenda Cockle? Yeah, yeah. it is. <laughs> She's, she's getting you on film. You're a beautiful little <laughs> triangle thing. <laughs> Eric, yeah, we have uh, three guests from the community that joined us today. Right on. Um, so, so, okay, so all interesting. So how do people feel? So staffing, Colton, uniformity, expectations, appointment, Responsibility, resource allocation. Okay. All right, cool. Um, I, yes. I don't know, it might be a different section, but the, the question around sort of chair training, uh, maybe that's. So a that's in here. Uh, it's an interesting question because it turns out the city attorney's office actually does provide that, and but the challenges that we heard from city staff, the city attorney's office, uh, was that nobody shows up. So they offer the training and no one shows up. So they have a, you know, so there is no mandate for the chairs to show up. And so, because the questions that we talked about, um, this had to do also with Robert's rules. And the idea is that like, whether Robert's rules is or is not effective, it is definitely not effective if no one knows how to use it. And so if everyone's in there and they have different understandings of how to do it, uh, I was telling the city attorney that I had a mentor that wrote a book called Breaking Robert's Rules. But his point when doing negotiation in terms of skewing power dynamics, but his point wasn't that Robert's Rules doesn't work. It actually works really well, assuming everybody understands how to use it. But when you get into situations where, depending on someone's own personal experience, they come into a space and no one knows exactly what all these things mean. And yeah, I guess I would just say I think it is, I think it's such an important role in anybody, regardless of whether it's one with authority or a sort of small subcommittee. And I think it's really, it's not intuitive and it's not something that just anybody off the street can sort of normally do. And so there's, there's likely a training component, but it almost really requires some kind of sort of follow up or mentoring or something as well. I mean, sure. it's like, you know, giving somebody a presentation on how to be a teacher and then like they go and doesn't quite work. So I just think that it, it really, 
the, the outcomes of these groups are often really, really linked to the effectiveness of, of the chair along with the staff side of it. So I just, I would almost kind of put it in that, that staff resource side in a way because it's just such an important role. Well, I think I one of the ideas we had talked about potential recommendations is creating a separate office of resident engagement that, that would be staffed by people who would be the recording secretaries of all committees who would do orientation and training of all members so that we're not wasting valuable city attorney's time doing that. Um, that in addition to doing other uh, engagement things. But what uh, another thing, this also um, links back to a topic that at some point the yeah, whole Can I pause task quick, force, real yeah. quick just to that point? Does everybody, is everybody okay with, um, if I, because that is one of the things that we did. Again, this is not a final document. This is just kind of where we are. But if we put that in terms of the alternatives as having some semblance of an office of community representation, how do people yeah. feel? Sure. Okay, great. It's going to go on. Um, I mean, this goes yeah. back to that topic that we haven't yet uh, dealt with, no subcommittee or the task force has dealt with, and that's staffing in the mayor's office. Because someone in the mayor's office just did get a reclassification and a and a raise to be doing the training of chairs and committees, although that work hasn't actually happened. Yeah, Lila well, got a re reclassification, but it's just you know it's back on you. So if we're looking at how are we going to resource some of these things, those things are supposedly being paid for. They're just they're not happening. Okay, so I, we have for the bullets, I have, I just did add that Office of Community Representation or some semblance of a permanent structure that its sole purpose is to support, support uh, not just the committees, because we have someone that does that, but to support the representation, communication, and uh, equity issues of the committees. And I think that would, so, I'm sorry, John, no, no, but just to finish this and put a point on it, that would address Legistar issue. If we had a standard at like staff who were trained on being recording secretaries, all of that would be standardized. Legistar issues would be standardized, or at least there would be a small number of people accountable instead of who's staffing that and who was there and who, you know, I think that would go some ways towards that. So again, if, again, these are right now. This is just to capture some of the things that have come up, so we don't have to flesh everything. <laughs> yes, sir. And one of the other things goes to Brenda's point is I think it's really important to include any of these in part of it's the legislature issue that you mentioned but I think there should be a, a formalized part of feedback if people come and appear before a committee when that committee makes a decision they should be notified right away they took the time to come they should know what that what, what was recommended and that's part of you know minutes preparation but it's also that there's a platform on which that can take place okay good good point so we're going to get that in terms of the office of in, in everything that we're talking about. We've got to just make sure that I'm trying to type it out, but keeping it as a bullet and not a. That's kind of a sub point of accountability, but lack of feedback. Mm -hmm. I just thought I would inform you that in a couple of weeks, a bunch of staff are getting together to talk about doing something more with our training program. We started to get notices that we're going to do the same stuff we've done in the past. And I said, stop, let's sit down, let's talk about training for alders, especially new alders, mm -hmm. so staff training in all of these issues, and training for committee chairs and members, especially and in particular this issue that you guys have raised. Mm -hmm. But they don't know what their committee is supposed to do. Yeah. And somebody's got to tell them. Now, I'm not sure it should be us, because a lot of times you just read the ordinance and the, mm -hmm. you know, the real staff people know what they really do. But anyway, just. <laughs> That's just a point of invitation. I have a job here. I'm not exactly yeah. sure. <laughs> yes. A piece of feedback on that is when, when the original trainings first came out, they seemed to all be like at times when a lot of committees were like not meeting, which also meant that everybody was out of town. So if the meetings are held in August, when everybody's getting ready to go back to school and the committees aren't meeting, you're not going to have a lot of people attend. That's sort of when everybody, oh, second half of August, everybody takes off, there's no city meetings we're all going to take a break. Well, then everybody was available to do the training, but people weren't available to attend. And so I think the timing and, and doing it more than just once a year because the committee changes happen throughout the year. And ha having the video recorded was good, but I, 
Um, I, you know, we spent a couple more minutes, you know, however long on this item, I mean, we do have a few things that we did want to get to today uh, to flesh out a few of these alternatives a little bit more in detail or in depth. Um, but, you know, we can, you know, I want to make sure when we give this report next week that we're, we're capturing some stuff. I'm curious, I'd be curious to get your guys' thoughts. I mean, because this is, <laughs> I'm just, uh, with 102 that we know of, Boards, commissions, and committees, because one's created every 16 seconds. Uh, if you think about and aggregate what that means in terms of to training to you know to do that, I, you know, again, um, I just am curious about how those things are related, or how people see this as being related, because it seems like if we, you know, I think a challenge that we have here again is that they're created with no sunset. You know, like this is created for a purpose, and you got. 24 months to come up with an answer, and this is how we're going to use that answer and defining that all at the front end through the actual legislation that creates the thing. Because that way, when people are looking at this thing, they know whether or not they're interested in being part of it. You train them up for that thing, and then when they, you know, that, and even if it is something that would have a recurring thing, but it's a way to diversify and to change up the people who are on these committees, even if they are things that are in general, as we look at them today. They're standing committees, commissions, or boards, but do they have to be, right? Like some of them probably should be, but there's a few of them that probably could be created as necessary, or they could be reactivated and turned back on as necessary to address certain things. And then you say to the public, public, this is what's going on. This is the way that we're defining this committee charge for this topic. These are the things that we're going to be asking. This is the amount of time that you have to come on this thing. And this is what we're going to do with your information. So, because otherwise you could go and yell your stuff into the woods. Uh, but, you know, this is how we're going to use your information. Would that, to Eric's point, would that change the way or would that affect or could it potentially affect the um, representation of the interest in actually serving on these things? And I get that, you know, like I don't see how I could ever be on a standing committee. I would never, I don't have time to do that. Like if these things for me, if they're not sunset, I have no interest at all. So, what, Eric? How are you feeling? I'm I'm feeling good. I mean, I just think we should, if we can just just build these down to what we're and be okay with the, the you know the option of just putting it on in the document. It'll make for a good discussion um, when we when it's presented. Okay. How are we feeling with this document? Hey, yes, sir. I, I, I don't know if this has been discussed before, but um, kind of speaking to some of the things that I've heard about sort of number of and clarity of accountability and authority and all these things, it, it, it might be worth looking at a structure that has uh, a fewer number of these standing bodies and then really looking to align some of the sort of smaller, more focused groups <coughs> kind of reporting or being subgroups of those standing bodies, because right now it feels like I we're gonna, saw that, and maybe, maybe yeah. we're going to be discussing this in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, and I'll hold it. And again, one, uh, Derek, we're looking at uh, the the Rothschild plan. Um, is that we asked? Can I ask a question about the Rothschild plan? Is well, this real quick before we do. I mean, yeah, just let's a do it, very but, technical. But I'm not, about I, both we can spend some time on it. I just want to know if we can move on. If, uh, how are people feeling right now? I added those things. How are people feeling right now? I mean, you guys can't see. <laughs> pass this around. Can you, can you review the, the addition, please? Yeah. Um, there's disparities in authority where authority is not clearly defined and it's not uniform across the committees, committees, yeah, commissions, and boards. The, the Okay, so, sorry. These are the challenges that we are trying to address, not alternative. Sorry, hold on one second. So I'll just start at the top. Um, for section three, what we added was staffing, colon, uniformity expectations, appointment responsibility, resource allocation, and reporting requirement. Uh, the other challenge that we added for section three was 
disparities in authority and lack of clarity around the authority of the of the committees. All right. Next thing we added. Well, the question that I added to this uh, section four, subsection three had more to do with authority. So can we put language in here? Because what? Authority slash influence. Yeah. Instead of jurisdiction. Uh, right. Switching jurisdiction to authority slash influence. Okay. And then for... Um, Alternatives discussed, we added the Office of Community Representation, which will be responsible for the guidance, training, and then I just have guidance and training. What number are you under? I am in uh, number five, bullet. This is an additional bullet. Didn't you say that that would also provide the nuts and bolts staffing to the committees? Like minutes and agendas and that. Yeah. Right. So yeah. how are people feeling? The other one that was mentioned was greater use of ad hoc committees with a specified term of duty. I didn't see that in here anymore. Okay, got it. Um, just as a question of clarity, would you see this committee as providing the staffing for these committees or providing or be in charge of seeing that they're staffing for these committees? Well, and the question, I mean, I we can talk about it. I mean, the question is, does it affect the bullet? Because if we can be done with this agenda, we can get right into that. We yeah. can talk about both those things because they're alternatives and they are relevant for today's conversation. I, I, mean, so, I mean, no, but I think it's a good question. When I brought it up, I meant specifically recording secretary. So not content area okay. staff, but just recording secretary. Minutes and reporting. Right. Mm -hmm. And that they, they would serve, they would work together with the chair to make things go and if the chair you know and the chair would have the authority to say what city staff they need to be present and I mean in some of the committees commissions and boards it's obvious what you know planning commission planning staff has to be there right it's, yeah. it's just obvious but I think it to put the note the the recording secretary as just a technical person that would make sure the technical work got done correctly and uniformly so you see and that there wouldn't be any like uh, variation of influence of that person, which does happen. So this would be like a little staff unit located maybe under the council or something. Or something. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So like an office of the ALJs or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, I I just something wanted to make sure that we, yeah. that this group that we were talking about wasn't intended to provide the actual staffing that knew something about zoning. And we're, we're, yeah, we're not even. That. Yeah. All this is. I didn't take that, but just so. So um, you'll shoot that to John. Yeah, and so uh, just real quick though, uh, it's hard to ask you guys to look at something you guys can't see. Um, I said look at something you guys can't see. The, uh, how do people feel about, assuming, you know, with the additions that I just added, do people feel okay with this being the report? Uh, but, so the last addition that I heard was the recording person. Did you say that? Yeah, that's in here. That was the last thing they talked about there. And then the okay. greater use of the ad hoc committees with clearly defined mission and authorities, oversight and reporting requirements, and staff. Okay, I'm having trouble here because are we capturing the um, real authority of the committee and, and representation? Yes. That was captured okay. in, uh, that was captured in three, item three of the document. Oh, I mean, as an, as an alternative. Uh, okay, so, so the alternative is to have more representation and equity uh, in terms of authority. You know, I'm not, I'm not really talking about equity. I don't know if it's just an a, a issue with the communication medium. I'm, I'm really discussing that if, the, if we're participating, somebody participating in a 
commission or a committee and that committee is representative, then there, there really shouldn't be any reason why their their recommendation is is not followed. Um, well, committees need real authority. Um, that, that's my perspective. Um, it's, a, it's an option of an alternative, and I think it's something that needs to be in this document <laughs> reference that is close to considering something in that area. Um, so I don't, I mean, it's been, I've said it a few times, being on the line with you all, um, that we need those three things, real decision-making authority, real representation, um, and, dang, I'm forgetting the last one, I thought it was going to roll. Clarity. But, Clarity. 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 And clarity, you said. Clarity on, on, on uh, decision-making authority. So, so those, those are, are important as alternatives to call out specifics. Okay, so I added that. I added an alternative. I mean, and we'll just do that for the document, and we'll, we can get into this conversation. It, assuming, so I added that to this document I'm going to send that we're going to, that I'll report on Wednesday. Um, with those additions, how do people feel about this? And again, this is not, you will not have to flesh these out for this document. We just need to capture what we've known. Does everybody feel okay with it? Can we, yeah. I mean, uh, this is something, can we accept this thing? Just so I'm recording. Yeah. So I would entertain a motion to accept as, this update. As, I, as, 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 so we say that to accept <coughs> the subcommittee report as? Yeah, as our report. As, as amended today. Yeah. Second. Second. All right. Is there any further discussion on this document? Hearing none, yes. all those Yeah, approved? I'm sorry, yes. Okay. And this applies to the next document, too. And this is a question for John. Are these documents in that document dump on the TFOGS Legistar? Yeah, this one number. This one went in today, and then the one I'll talk. This is the the other one that you have is the um, is just some an alternative that our office came up with based on John's alternative. So those are so these are all in in that file. Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. We are back to the motion. Uh, any further discussion? There is no further discussion. All those in favor of adopting this for our report, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, turn to oppositions. All right, now we can move into the, um, the specifics, which is potential strategy for addressing cons of current boards, commissions, and committees. Thank you to uh, the city attorney's office for providing us our taxonomical or our chart here, it's technology. Um, Eric, a question I would have, I have for you about this, um, and it always goes back to how, do, who gets to define what appropriate representation is? And I totally agree with you. Like, again, it's one of those things that, as a rhetorical device, I completely agree. We should have representation, and uh, in terms of decisions that are made uh, across the city, and that representation should have a voice that should be taken seriously and codified. The question, it always comes down to how, who gets to define what representation looks like. I always use the stats, the data I use for equity in terms of the distribution of race in Madison, Wisconsin, is what we use at Vital Records to talk about who's born in this city. And the city is much more diverse if you look at who's born here than who lives here. Because we have an import factor where we import white people annually. Um, so our school district is, I would say, another barometer. So I say every representation in terms of every body should look like our school district, which is about 55% folks of color. Now, a lot of people will use census reporting, which again is, I would say, skewed because of this importation factor. So they say that the city is only 17% folks of color. And where you find this is that somehow we've stayed at that number forever, but the increase of our representation in our schools has been phenomenal over the last 25 years. And so I, uh, those two things just don't add up. So all that to say, Eric, the question I have is how do you, how do we circle that square? Because that will always be a point of contention, right? Um, and we're just, we can start with this, with Eric's uh, alternative here. But the, the question is how do you do that? How do you dictate that, a, or who gets to dictate whether or not a committee is adequately representative for the issue that they're looking at? And then based on that, Therefore, they have power to make decisions. Yeah, so this is an important question. I appreciate it. One of the issues, uh, one of the ways that we addressed this was um, to, speaking in, in terms of the, our council community pilot, was to ask the community what factors 
should we consider when we're trying to determine how closely someone is impacted by an issue? And those, what came from that was uh, a list of criteria to consider and to basically rank people on a scale in terms of their where they stand as it relates to the issue. So an example would be uh, physical proximity to whatever the thing is being discussed, um, racial representation in terms of whatever is being discussed, if there's a disparity in arrest and the disparity excuse for African American folks, then African American folks are closer to the issue in that regard and therefore more impacted by that issue. Um, another would be the level of participation in whatever thing is being discussed. So uh, an officer who is discussing the issue of mass incarceration or the arrest of disparity um, might be considered high in terms of their participation. Um, and also, you know, a, a re-entry person might also be considered high in terms of participation. But the idea is to ask the community um, or have a, a, a starter list of things to consider when we're trying to understand impact, um, which could be a use of, could be another word used for representation, and just start from there. And then based on that, that we're asking the community to decide what representation looks like, and that's a thing that should be continuously addressed. But it's something that we should at least start trying to address if we're going to get better at it. If we can agree that it needs to be a part of the conversation, then I don't think a barrier should be we just don't know how to do it. I think that we should start trying, and, th and in that way, we'll, we'll get better at it. But so, that, that's the start. so I got it. I mean, you know, and again, I hear what you said. I, there's a couple things, though, that I, you know, and you know where I'm going to go with this, which is I, my opinion is that community is a verb, not a noun, uh, in terms of its origin and the way that the term actually works. Uh, it's something that is happening, not something that exists. And the reason is because of the ubiquity that's associated with it. So who gets to define, again, what community entails? Because on, for all intents and purposes, a lot of people say that that's what we do right now. We ask the community who do they want to make decisions on our behalf, and we have a form of representative democracy, and the community votes on who should be in charge, and then those people are making decisions. And so I well, just say that... Well, well, I mean, I'm with you, but this is what I'm saying, is that right now, in one sense, that's what we have, where the community is making, they, the community is asked who is who should be involved in decision making, and they choose by a public forum, we ask them to come out and vote. So, you see what I'm saying? How do we define the community that would make these calls? That the community, who gets to define impact? Who gets to define what representation should be and this is all we, it goes back to this question of like who has that authority to make that decision? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I, I think this is still addressing the same, that same process of understanding and, and reaching out to the community specifically to ask about how we understand and document impact um, so that we can understand who to, what individuals to listen to more, which is fundamentally different from asking who should represent someone regardless of their level of impact um, as it relates to whatever issue is being discussed. So I think those things are, they, we hope that they serve the same function of representation, but they, they don't. And we're seeing the impact of that now, which is part of the reason why we're having this discussion in the first place. So I think that what we have to do is, you know, instead of giving a person the authority to decide who is impacted, we simply create a process for assessing impact that we can continuously come back to. And I think that that would, at least in part, mitigate the shortcomings of a finding to a transient community where, you know, so the criteria might change based on who's participating and who's doing the, the, doing the community thing. But it's a question that we need to get better at asking and it needs can start to imagine a, a process that is ongoing where we understand and assess impacts. We'll get better at meeting the needs of people who are coming in and out of the, the areas that we're talking about. So, I, John and then Rebecca, uh, Alder King. It, it's, it sounds a little bit, Eric, like you're asking for a, 
what I would call, I mean, in the land use area, the environment, environmental impact statement, a policy impact statement, um, be prepared on, and I can't imagine if you do it on everything, but on, on major issues? Is that well, sort of thing? Would be somebody who would do this? Well, the question, so what I would say, though, I, mean, I can name analysis. a number of projects that have went through this racial equity tool they have at the city that are horrible for folks of color, but somehow the city is saying that they they have a tool, they're doing that. What do you mean? We have that right now. We go through this racial equity tool and we determine impact and all you do is write down on the form. So you ask the people, how does this affect these people? And you say, well, it doesn't. And then because they said, well, it doesn't, now it doesn't have that impact on anybody. And like the oversight of that. Uh, Eric, but that was a question back to you about the, uh, the, what Mr. Rothschild said. Does that make sense in terms of what you said? I understand uh, policy impact statements as a thing that that sort of attempts to understand impact, um, but it's sort of in the reverse order. Mm -hmm. So you have a, a policy, and then we then try to figure out how this is going to impact different populations. Um, and I think that. What I'm talking about is actually in reverse of that, is that we figure out who is impacted by the potential of this policy and then engage those folks in drafting the, the policy. Um, that, so it's kind of like thinking backwards. And in order to do a policy impact uh, statement effectively, we have to be able to under, you have to be able to land on criteria for impact. So there's, it's not like it's a, a thing that we just don't know how to how to tackle. Um, we, we understand some semblance of impact, um, and we can if we can talk about those things before we start to make decisions, and then the people who are making who are participating are the ones who are impacted. Then we'll like we'll have more of a reason to support the decisions that come from those committees and hopefully they'll be better ones. Father Kimball. So um, I think what uh, the process that Eric is outlining would align really well if we switched over to ad hoc committees that address discrete issues that we defined a very discrete purpose and that would make that job of analyzing um, who are the impacted people a lot easier than if we did it for standing committees because standing committees as they are take up you know a vast number of disparate issues but I think we should um, consider that approach to be really well uh, in sync in harmony with if we move to some ad hoc committees so so it's interesting I just want to for uh our city staff representation we're hearing this question that's coming up between process and structure that is i think a big thing here right and this brings out our old or theory don't they still teach that in law school and they got rid of all the marxists i know they started to stop teaching this stuff so but no uh but this is a thing right so some of this stuff is process some of it is structure so um yeah i you know anything anyone else i mean uh so I'm trying to, you know, in terms of how we're looking at this as an alternative that we would present, I mean, I I have a number of questions about this just because, and again, it's I totally agree, and I'm totally jaded, and so, you know, take it for whatever it's worth, but the, the political world impact is very contentious. Yeah. And you, I mean, who's going to be impacted by, let's hypothetically say, they're going to build a ridiculous giant monstrosity at the border for whatever reason, Who's impacted by that? Well, it's a matter of debate. And so like a lot of people will come out and say that they're gonna be impacted. I have an example anecdotally of a, working in a school in San Diego where the 4% rule where top 4% of the people when they graduate from any high school get automatic acceptance to University of California or Cal State. We were a continuation school, but we made the case that our students should be able to, even though they're a continuation school, we should still apply. We had people who came from very wealthy areas who came out and opposed that because they said their kids are going to be the most impacted by that because they made this case that they, if they're you know if they just got their kids to get kicked out of school they can come to our school and be the top four percent and so therefore it's denying their kids opportunity and so therefore they're impacted all i'm saying is that how do we how would we square that how do you 
mitigate the, that will be a contentious space about who actually is most impacted. And I don't, I think maybe in like minds we could say, oh, that's obvious if it's a situation about let's hypothetically, you know, policing or something, and you say, well, let's look at who actually is arrested and what the disparities show. You could say, well, we need representation from them, but a lot of other people would say they're actually not the ones who are the most impacted by this. It's the victims of the crimes that are being committed, and therefore they should be the ones who are overwhelmingly represented. And so, like, I, I just am curious about how we do that. How do we get through those things? Yes, sir. I guess the other thing that I'm kind of struggling with is the difference between sort of policy and individual sort of decisions. And so I, I met with a neighbor today that is, you know, has been concerned about the, the installing a sidewalk in their neighborhood, right? So this is something that people have heard about. So there's a policy question. We have an adopted policy that every time we reconstruct, we're going to put in sidewalks. That has a lot of implications. Who are the who are the sort of stakeholders in that? Well, it's sort of any any property owner or anybody that would walk or etc. Then there's like a specific project in a specific neighborhood and whether that one gets the sidewalk or not there's sort of a, a policy here and but then there's a question of should it or shouldn't and then there the stakeholders are probably more the specific property holders there and everybody within a you know walking distance of it. So you know we have in our current structure we have a <coughs> transportation policy and planning board that would review the broad city policy and then we have another body that's, that's going to answer the question on this project and so I guess I'm just trying to understand this question of representation who's the most impacted and how do you how do you do that in sort of I think two very different ways one is sort of citywide policy and another one is specific especially geographic kind of questions or, or questions that really clearly impact one group more than another so uh, that's a great point and I think a question that I have and again a good example of this is neighborhood associations uh, brought this up twice today. They argue that they are the ones who are most impacted by a decision that's being made. So we want to then I'll use something that's close to me, but I want to create affordable housing. And I think we need more of it at low density, not like single family residential, but low density on um, not East Washington Main Boulevards, but you need it in the Marquette neighborhood, the Monroe Street neighborhood. Now, who's the most impacted by the creation of this affordable housing? I will tell you that neighborhood associations will run up and down and say that it's them, all six of them that ever post on either of these lists. Or, no, but the uh, neighborhood association will um, come out and say that this structure works. They are, the, they are the neighborhood association. They're impacted by this. They should have a voice. Now, never mind that, you know, again, they're not elected. Uh, by the city, you know, so really I say that it's not the neighborhood association, it's the people that don't have housing and that can't live in the city, they're the most impacted. So a classic case, so how do you square that circle? So I'm a, if I can jump in here, um, there, there are two different conversations that we're having. Um, one is about the potential for an alternative, and then another is all of the possibility um, and you know shortcomings or prophecies involved in this particular um, alternative, which is not something that I think we need to decide in order to have this discussion um, in a more intentional and purposeful setting. I think our, if our purpose right now is to discuss an alternative um, and to figure out if that's an alternative that we're going to recommend, that you know we're we're doing that, and we don't really need to get into the weeds in terms of what the written policy is going to be or could be and how it's going to make how we're going to make sure it addresses every potential issue that could come before it but aside from that um and with that with that being said the idea of impact here is that we have a baseline and, and part of my participation here and some of the the i guess experience that i'm bringing is our study and attempt to continue to study the idea of addressing impact before uh, a free decision and free policy. And we have a baseline of criteria to begin that discussion of what it could look like. And I think that that, that discussion is something that should be had by a separate body or another group that is intentional about, if, if, this, if these are recommendations that end up being accepted, that then that's something that could be explored at a deeper level. But having a baseline of physical proximity, the amount that it affects your livelihood, uh, your safety as it relates to the issue, um, geographic, racial, socioeconomic, 
these things are just baseline criteria that we can use to document and and objectively and empirically make an a, a attempt to understand and see impact in a way where we can put it on a gradient and clearly know who we need to listen to more. It would start, and I think that it's way better than you know the anecdotal. I had a conversation with this group, and I really appreciate that <coughs> a loud speaking person that we have now. Um, it's a start. So if we can agree that this is a potential alternative that we can begin discussing, that a group who's gonna who may implement this in the future can discuss with a baseline idea of what that criteria could be, then I think we're in good shape. And I don't, I don't really see much value in, in, in talking about all of the individual possible applications of this alternative before we even we're in the, in the setting to actually explore those past conversations. Well, I mean, on the agenda right now, what we are doing is discussing the pros and cons of alternatives, of the alternatives that have been presented. but. I hear what you're saying. We could exhaust these things. I totally don't. I don't disagree at all. That's an alternative. I just all I'm saying is, for all intents and purposes, I don't think. I feel like what you're suggesting exists. In, you know, it could be an argument. Arguments could be made that that already exists. And I hear what you're saying. I don't think it does either. In terms of what you're saying, I don't agree that it exists either. But I just, for all intents and purposes, if we were to bring this forward, I just could see that argument being made. But. I do want to move. We've got to get to John's work. What's that? So are we talking about pros or cons now? Well, right now we're kind of looking at these things and going through just a discussion about the different alternatives. I do want to spend a little bit of time. I, how do we capture this, I guess, is the question, so that we can capture what you're saying. Um, because, again, so you have representative, you have committees that are representative chosen based on levels of impact, le levels of impact on the people who serve on them. And Eric, let me just say, 10-4, I completely agree with what you just said about we, we really need to look at different ways of how we can, can uh, um, constitute committees, because what you're suggesting is far, far, far better than what we have now which is just people who know that they can apply to the committees and know how to do it, submit their letters and maybe get a response from the mayor's office or maybe not. And, you know, it's really, uh, they, there's so much, there's not much we would have to do to improve on what we have now. And what you're suggesting is a, um, a, a process that would bring up so many important, um, just in the process itself, so many important aspects of whatever issue it is that needs to be decided on uh, at the front end. Um, and I really appreciate that about what you're bringing to this. Uh, John. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, uh, it really goes to your point. I think the most important thing is that we identify those who will be impacted, not making an evaluation of who is most impacted. So that the decision should take into account all who are impacted and all who are impacted should have the opportunity to be heard, whether they're on the committee or not on the committee. Or right? So, you know, if it's a street in downtown Madison, people on the far west side and the far east side are going to be impacted and they should be heard, but so should the people who live on that street. Um, and so should the, the pedestrians and the bikers. And I don't think we have to say, you know, the bikers are more important than the people who live on the far east side or the west side, or the homeowners. I, I they, think we do, and that's, I think that's the yeah. point. I'm well, who decides that? That's what Justice was saying. And I thought to avoid avoid that, we really want to at least start with determining who's impacted rather than who is most impacted. And the most impact should be what's, then when it gets to the committee, who's decided, you know, what's the priorities. Um, Yes, sir. Uh, I think what I'm hearing makes a ton of sense as a sort of framework for a sort of specific topic or decision. And I think maybe Alder Kemble mentioned that maybe it was something else, but this might also lend itself especially well to the sort of ad hoc committee concept. If you think about some of the larger sort of broader bodies like Board of Public Works, it's really difficult for me to understand how this framework would be used to do that because you're, you're I mean, then I think the, the rubric would just simply be what are kind of the demographics of Madison and who, how do we best represent everybody because it just covers such a breadth of issues that I, I don't know how you would sort of 
do what I'm hearing on a body like that. Um, I have to. I have to jump in. I don't know if there's a hand or not, but I mean, this is a hair breadth away from exactly what we already have right now. Um, you know, what we have right now is a system in which we just consider who is generally. And can y'all hear me over my my toddler? Yeah. Yes. Right. Okay. Cool. So, I mean, what we have already is a system in which we attempt to identify everyone who is impacted and listen to them. Um, and one of the issues with that is that the people who are typically most impacted, or, or and we, we tend to conflate that with the people who are most disenfranchised, are not the ones that are listened to. Instead, we're listening to a, a subset of that that actually is not a subset of those that are disenfranchised, but a subset of those who we deem impacted because they happen to live in the city and maybe peripherally involved or related and they happen to have an agenda or an idea or a solution that is actually converse and not beneficial to those that are most disenfranchised, who we're trying to solve this problem for. So I think that we have to be really intentional about addressing a gradient of understanding a gradient of impact so that we can balance the social, the, the imbalanced structure of, uh, of, of uh, social power. Um, and, and you know we have a majority of, of we have a majority group that may or may not be the majority. We have folks who tend to have more influence and accessibility. We have folks. So if we level the playing field in terms of impact, then we're allowing the, the issues that are the issues of society to create imbalance, and that the people who have more access or understanding of the process or more wealth, etc end up being heard more. So to balance that, we focus on this gradient of impact that allows us to identify past those those markers of access, et cetera, to hear the people who we don't hear. And if we don't do that intentionally, then we're going to continue to miss that voice and just talk to everyone who is impacted. I think we should hear everyone who is impacted, but I think we should listen to, more, to the people who are most impacted more because that's what we're not doing. We are listening to the people who are impacted, and we're also listening to people who aren't impacted. But if we could listen to the people who are impacted most, then we might actually understand the nuances of the issue that we're trying to solve and come up with better plans. All right. um, I want to move to Johnston. I, I, we can, we have another meeting. So, I mean, we have another meeting. We can go over this. I can. I you know I don't know that anyone disagrees in this room. I will, I mean, I, you know, when I go back to this, which is like, who are we doing this for and what are we trying to do in this conversation? I will say that there are probably a number of people who are just fine with the way it is. And so, uh, and it's not a house on fire. You all know the house on fire analogy, which is like, you tell me your house is on fire and before, you know, you don't have to tell me how you would build a new house that isn't on fire to say we need to get out of the house. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you just say we've got to get out of the house. So. I understand what you're saying. I don't think it works right now either, and I, I have huge issues with how we look at this idea of representation. I wonder whether or not, I think a lot of this is, function, is a function of the larger structure and the larger conversation that has guided local politics for the last century, um, which has left us in a situation that I think is very difficult. I think what we want is something where we just have to make a few tweaks, and somehow it's just gonna solve itself and actually, if we're serious about doing this, it's going to be radical changes. Uh, and the examples that I've given is like Minneapolis did do, they changed their zoning, which I was surprised that Madison is going the opposite way. So again, it's not to ever discourage it. It's just saying that the world that I live in, Madison, you know, like the city is not very uh, interested in making these changes. And you find a way to get the elected officials to relinquish power and diminish the power of the executive. I'm all for it. I don't see it, but I totally agree that it needs to happen. Um, so we got the, I mean, I do want, I mean, for whatever it's worth, we have another meeting to go over this before we go through and do our, rep, uh, our report. I think for the report, we could, I think, flesh this out a bit about why this is necessary. And we can make that case and as a subcommittee of the larger task force, this is our job, right? And so we want to say that this is the issue that we all agree on as being critical, then we can make that case and we can bring it to the uh, full committee. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like that's totally our purview. How are people feeling? Let's move on. All right. And again, we will come back to stuff. All right, so another alternative. 
and I don't think that they're exclusive at all, so we can keep uh, the general gist of everything we've just discussed at the, at the forefront here as we look at the Rothschild plan. Um, and again, thinking about the an what questions is this answering, and uh, initially we said let's not get hung up on the names of these individual committees, let's just look at the structure. I don't know if we want to actually look at the names at some point and say that these are, you know, whether these committees would be the ones, uh, but just for all intents and purposes we did say that these are kind of placeholders as we play with this. So. Uh, how do people feel about starting with the structure itself and then getting into the, the details later? I just wanted to clarify, and John nicely tried to put this in a, le in a legible format that we could look at. Um, it is different than what I had originally written up, and, and it's just a question of the graphics that he was using wouldn't let him do it, but that under two of the columns, it was never my intention that any of these subcommittees would report to another subcommittee. They all reported back up to the, to the committee at the top, so that the lines that are on the first three columns are correct, and the one in the middle two columns are not correct. Oh, right. That's what you're saying. It yeah. There needs like to be a sideline there. Yeah. yeah, but he just couldn't get it to work, and so it, it came out the way it did. But that was not my intention, and in, in that all there's, you know, that just in terms of if anybody's here that hasn't been heard me before on what I was saying is that all of the top committees above those lines are committees that Alders would serve on in greater numbers uh, and they would and we would not be requiring Alders to serve on any of the committees below that but they were right. three to go so they wouldn't count in quorums they wouldn't have voting rights but clearly they could attend so Potentially, just and to, just to keep us thinking this way, one of the things that we're suggesting is uh, that this is going to address is the time allocation necessary by each alder, mm -hmm. because they would not, in this model, have to be on. We would not. Every committee would not have to have a alder on it. So that's mm -hmm. one thing that this is addressing. So the pro. Uh, any other things that we see this as addressing in terms of the structure, in terms of the challenges that we that we brought up right now? And um, everything we just identified in that document, we could use though that list. This, I mean, it was also the element of accountability that there was a uh, you know a standing committee, and, you know, they, Rebecca called them super committee, mother committees, mother committees, <laughs> mother committees. <laughs> uh, that that would be that would be responsible for getting reports from these, making sure that they were um, doing what they were supposed to do or not doing what they were supposed to do. In other words, we would put some of the responsibility on these partial council committees to um, make sure that they still had something to do, then they were doing it right and asking for reports. So right, so okay, so under this, the what's implicit in this model is that these. The um, a lot of the committees that are not the permanent ones at the top uh, would be ad hoc in some level. That, that that would be a potential. So what this would also address is the uh, you would have more of a fluid structure. So these things would be created, and then all of the things that we talked about in terms of definition of their role, scope, uh, size, charge, authorities, all those things would be addressed. So you have that also. So that addresses that. Um, just keeping everything that Eric was talking about in our, you know, again at the forefront, does this structure itself or does this inherently address any of the issues that we have with representation? I would say the one way that it could potentially is assuming what we just said, that the, these uh, other committees would be done in a more fluid manner so they would have, they would be created to address specific issues and then we could use the impact gradient to figure out how or what the appropriate um, composition. composition of the committees would be, and then we would also be able to empower them with, and potentially give them or define at least what type of authority they would have uh, as we made them. It does in that level. Are there other ways that this addresses? Well, it, uh, on the face of it, unless explicitly um, indicated otherwise it looks like it's putting another level of authority in between 
the committees and the council. So if these committees aren't reporting directly to the council, um, it would seem on the face of it to take authority away from the well, committees unless it was specified that the mother committees had to accept and and put forward the recommendations <coughs> of the offspring. So, so, oh, so, it, but it, just to clarify this, you know, there's this whole other group that's not on this chart that relates to the adjudicatory and the uh, multi-jurisdictional um, bodies. This, this list of well, that's it's in the city attorneys. Is this is the multi-jurisdictional committee? Yeah. No. But it, I mean, on this chart, it's not there, and the reason right. it's not there is that these were all committees that at least had some element of being advisory committees. In my mind, going through this quickly, I put them here. Whether they're, they're all right or not, I don't know. And I think John added and, and fixed that up a little bit. But so there still would be direct reports to the council by the adjudicatory the, and the regulatory. These multi-jurisdictional Well, not just multi-jurisdictional, but the adjudicatory ones like ALRC. Which are at the top line. Are they top line here? They're not. No, they're not they're there. Not That's there. Oh, they're they're on, they were on mine, but they were okay. off to the side. And the I see them didn't fit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so, you know, I mean, again, it's just that I'm old and jaded and cynical. So don't take it as anything, but just, I just am imagining the political reality where the Common Council sees authority to another group, and then they're just going to take that, whatever the group comes up with, and go with it. I just don't understand where that ever exists. <clears throat> However, Let's just hold it for a second because what I hear, I mean, the idea though would be, and I think this goes back to clarity of purpose and charge. And I would say that in order for that to happen, a way would be, there would have to be a specific, probably up down, yes, no type of project that I would ask the committee to look at. Blue or green paint, go out there and make the decision and we'll come back and whatever you come back with, we're going to make sure that the people who are on this committee. We've assessed it through an impact gradient. We have brought them on because they are the best folks to make this decision. And whatever decision you come back with, we're going to take. Uh, so, under that structure, it would, I would say, implicitly, I imagine a world where the council would have to, they would be very, I think they would be very conservative in terms of the creation of said bodies. Because, and if they did come up with these bodies that they said, all right, we're going to make this, we're going to source this out, the political liabilities that they would have, I think, would be huge. Because if I realized that the person that I elected to make decisions on my behalf just relinquished that to a bunch of folks that I did not elect, I don't know that I would want to elect them a second time. Uh, but a second thing, I think uh, it could force them to be more disciplined about the questions that they're asking, right? Because it would say that, well, we're going to create this committee. We have to be very specific. If we're not going to have any say, we're going to take what they're going to say. So in that sense, it addresses, in theory, it could address some of these issues. But I don't, you know, to the folks in the room but who create have create other effects, such as the one you just described. Yeah. I, you know, and I, you know, I just imagine, you know, to the folks who are more I've never been uh, older in the city of Madison. I don't understand. I'm just not my language. So if you think that if I'm totally mistaken or off base and you think that there is a scenario where alders would relinquish that authority, then I'm totally wrong. Yes, sir. Justice, um, I'm going to ask John a couple questions. Was it your understanding, John, with this organizational structure you set up that these mother committees would have a certain number of council representatives on them? Yes. And then that those committees, again, would be advisory to the city council? Is that yes. correct? Mm -hmm. Well, but some of them, like Plan and Public Works, have their own independent. Yeah, they're not even listed on the Public they Works. Are. Yeah. yeah, they're there. Are those, yeah. But this, this does not include those statutory committees, right? Like the Board of Public Works and the Planning Commission. Yes, it prior. is. Yeah. They would be given additional responsibilities for supervising and coordinating these subcommittees. Okay. Uh, it's just, it just, you know, when I started looking at the whole concept of the committees, and you couldn't even find them anywhere, I thought, you know, <laughs> and we have organizations for every department in the city. We have the employees, Elizabeth, you know, all that. Well, how, 
could somebody just look at a chart and see, you know, what are the committees? That's where I started with this. And then I started thinking about the impact of on alders and the amount of time that they have to spend as part-time alders on committees, and yet take into consideration the fact that these citizen committees somehow want a, an opportunity to have discussion with the alders. So this was an opportunity to have alders and committee members all come together at some point and be a funnel to council meetings and thereby hopefully some of the issues would be fleshed out better so that the council meetings didn't last for you know, yeah. 10 hours. And then was, so it was basically yeah. designed to reduce the workload of the council members by concentrating them on a few of these mother committees and then all these other committees would basically submit their recommendations to the mother committee which would then sift and winnow and pass it on to the council, right? I mean, yeah. that's a trade-off you're trying to make. Right. Yeah. 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 And to, to Mr. Goodman, to, uh, another thing that we had that we figured out is when we did just pull the list of all of them that are registered, there's things like CARPSI and the Community Action Coalition and Madison Development Corporation that are technically created and mandated, you know, by statute, so they're listed as committees, uh, but they're not. Yeah. Commit. I mean, I don't. What is CARPC? It is an interesting thing, right? Like CARPC is making a plan. They are actively working on a 2050 plan that has severe policy implications. And I hope they're not wasting their time because I'm on that daggone thing. And if that's what I'm wasting more of my time, you know. So what are they though? If they're not, it's regional. Planning. It's a regional oh, planning, planning commission. Okay. That has representation from the common council. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And so, but yeah. so, I feel yeah. like Community Action Coalition does too, doesn't it? Or is mm -hmm. Dave Aaron's yeah. just on? Yeah. yeah, that's what I thought. So, like, how do you account for those interesting things that have been created by statute but are not, you know? Okay, so. Brent had a Yeah. And then Brent. Um, I, I, I like the kind of high level ideas of uh, sort of um, fewer, um, broader scope, older bodies and then sort of a more a more nested um, organizational structure than the current you know hundred plus basically all reporting to the council in a way um, one thing that I think would be really important to consider is um, alignment with the city staff organization structure and in my experience the committees commissions boards that are most closely aligned in sort of in purpose uh, with the way that we organize our city staff resources um, departments and divisions are the most successful and um, there would certainly be some of these sort of cross-functional uh, bodies looking at specific issues that wouldn't have a, a, a peer sort of staff di division but to the degree we, we have that alignment I think the um, I think the effectiveness of these bodies would be much higher and this question of sort of appropriate staff level support etc would be um, more guaranteed so you know maybe maybe looking at existing city structure, depart staff departmental structure, and <coughs> modeling where these bodies might align with that. And I, to, to some degree, I think that is here, or the, or the, the attorney's version, but I think in other ways, it's, it's not quite that way. And if, if we find that that organization would be, wouldn't work well, it might beg some questions about our uh, staff organizational structure then in that case. Mm -hmm. um, is there a hand? I, I have to run here shortly. Uh, well, okay, so what I'll, while you're here still, um, if we could keep, because I feel like there's a couple things, like, again, I go back to the structure versus process and the, you know, the interstitial that connects the two, or, and I, I'm sure there's some other stuff going on here. I think outcome and the actual, um, to try and stay away from impact, but, uh, but outcome or function or form of these things is also a separate thing. And so when we come back into our penultimate convening of the subcommittee on committees uh, I, we can spend the whole time probably going through this more because I think for the alternatives that we do have uh, kind of going through them I'm curious as to the degree to which they address some of the things that Eric is bringing up right and so whether or not this is actually doing stuff in terms of representation so Eric I mean we're gonna go back over this stuff and we're gonna bring this stuff back in so that, you know I don't want to I want to keep thinking about, uh, I want us to keep thinking about how different al or alternative forms do or do not address a number of the things that you brought up. Uh, right now, uh, Brenda? Um, I just wanted to point out that this is essentially how the county board is structured. 
um, they have their, their committees that the supervisors serve on, and then they have the committees that are advisory to those committees. And I'm not so certain that's a structure that works so well. <laughs> um, so, but it, again, it has maybe more to do with, you know, who's making the appointments or, um, but like some of the advisory committees below those mother committees um, are not taken very seriously. As a matter of fact, the people on those committees are often told, well, you're just advisory. Um, so it makes people feel like they're just wasting their time there. And I don't know how you really crack that because yeah. they're always, as Justice was pointing out, just still going to be advisory. Um, and I think that's more about the culture <coughs> of how we treat committees. Um, you know, if, if, if things are just being sent to committees because we have to send it to the committee and we don't care what they think, then what's the point? But if we're actually sending things to committees and asking them to, to you know, asking our citizens of our community to come up with the greatest ideas that they can and feed them to us so we can actually consider them to make good policies, that's a whole different thing that's got nothing to do with the structure. The other thing is the appointments to those, mm -hmm. it becomes very political. <laughs> and, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with the county board, but it's very yeah. political. And there are some people who will never get appointed and, and you know, who, become, who chairs that committee becomes super important because they can choose not to put things on the agenda. And when they choose not to put things on the agenda, that just basically kills it. Okay. So I, I'm not sure that the structure is solving well, those one of the things, kinds just of problems. Really quick thinking about this in terms of um, structure is I don't remember John. <laughs> you were saying something. It was something that was. Oh, well, I, I, I had not thought this completely through on that, but I did not propose in my thinking on this that we would adopt the county board system. Because I believe all of their committees are all members, and I did not think that that was the right way to go with this, so that we would continue to have uh, resident advocacies on these committees that are set up here uh, to the extent it's permissible under the statutes. I think maybe some are the composition might be statutory. I don't know, John, about public works. I don't know, but in any event, there still would be citizen participation. One of the places that uh, Brenda's comments do very much have to do with structure though is in the conversation we're having on the city council and whether or not they're two or four years mm -hmm. and the reason being as I see I mean I know this with the school board in particular in any given calendar year the whole thing changes you know the whole thing changes so if if a school board any school board creates a committee there is a good chance that by the time they're done with their work none of those people are even on the school board anymore so why would I listen I had nothing to do with the creation of said committee. Why would I listen to your recommendations? We're totally different. The people who were created you don't exist, or they're no longer in those roles. Why would we listen to you? And so the point here is that uh, as we look at at-large versus uh, geographic districts, where we look at the two or four-year terms, this there are implications to what Brenda's saying in terms of the structure of the government, right? All right, how are we doing? Yes, sir. So, um, just I did hand out before the meeting this, this these two little reds. Yeah. Um, hey, 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 uh, I, I do have to run. Um, I've got to attend to my son here, but I appreciated the discussion. Thanks for the work that y'all put in. Uh, great plan, uh, John. I'll just share some of the sentiments that were shared. Probably the need for organizing, but also the potential to. Um, disempowered participation. So again, down to the discussion and both and how to talk about it. Uh, yeah. Definitely. And so okay. yeah, again, yeah, okay, cool. All right, appreciate you, Eric. Thank you so much. Thanks, all right. All right. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, just just briefly, not to take up too much time, but Mike and I did sit down and take a look at this and we just tried to think through sort of some of the more specifics of having, for example, some of these are some of the mother committees are, are committees that don't currently exist, um, like the parks and public works, those are contemplated to be, I think, John, new new committees that would have purview over, for example, the Board of Public Works, Board of Parks Commissioners. And the first thing jumped out to Mike and I is, I'm not even sure that's possible. Yeah. That mm -hmm. we could create a body that would be able to interfere with something like the Board of Public Works. <coughs> yeah, and I, so, 
I just want to say I, I recognize that there that there were some things that the board of uh, right. the parks has authority <coughs> over, but there are also times when they're giving input on city policy. And so I was trying to figure out a way yeah. to do that. And, and but, so we yeah. we tried to sort of riff off of what John did using the same concept of mother committees, but trying to identify as ones that already existed uh -huh. and then create a structure under that that employed some of the concepts that you guys have been talking about, such as um, looking at uh, eliminating committees that have out, outlived their usefulness, combining committees that are on the same topic area, um, making some of these, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the table that is sort of wider, um, making the consideration of some of these being ad hoc along with um, a, an ordinance that clearly specifies, if you look kind of in the footnotes to this, there's, a, there's one that says, you know, create an ad hoc, ad hoc committee ordinance. It specifically says if you're going to create a committee, uh, an ad hoc committee that it needs to be clear in its purpose, it needs to identify what it's supposed to do, when it's supposed to do it, when it's going to end. Um, so that you don't end up with committees that out with the usefulness and those sorts of things. So if you go through, there's we've even made some suggestions about, hey, look, you know, we have however many committees on edu education and child services. How about combining those? And then we tried to group those under ones that we thought um, sort of made sense thinking about it within the concept of, you know, the CCEC really probably could take on a more significant role with respect to accountability over those ad hoc committees or committees that are related primarily to policy. Well, so if, you also look, if you look at underneath that, you know, that those that we tried to group sort of the ones that are they're kind of more related to policy, whereas the ones that are more related to administration, like amending oversight committee, street use committee, those kinds of things, we placed either um, placed under the finance committee, which is chaired by the mayor, or the common council, or not the common council, but, and you can kind of see how we sort of split those up um, with the common council then listing all of the, uh, all of the required and judicial, without sort of thinking about, well, the common council needs to be up here, and the CCEC and the finance need to be here, and these need to be down here, kind of hierarchy, which is, where would they be? And then on the back of that, um, listing all of those multi-jurisdictional committees that are either things like CARPSI that we're on with a bunch of other jurisdictions, um, things that are, uh, we call city committees, but are they really city committees? Um, and saying, you know, is it possible to create a more a clearer and more defined ordinance where we can house those um, so that they don't get confused with these ones that potentially more the ones that we've chosen to create. Um, so anyway, can completely ignore this, but it was trying to address sort of, our, it was kind of our take on the Rothschild plan in terms of how could we do that with the structure we already have, and maybe take that further step of looking at the ones that we do have, and what could be combined, what could be eliminated, what could be sort of restructured, um, based just on what's, what currently exists. So you don't even need to discuss it right now, no, I just want to explain I, what it is. I just um, wanted to, my, my Quick reaction on the structure. I I did specifically not include the CCEC or finance in there because those are all aldermanic committees, yeah. and I did not think that should be the role of these at that point in time. Yeah. So I didn't include those. But otherwise, I mean, I yeah, obviously you did a much more thorough job of what belonged in what column. Uh, uh, a couple things I'm intrigued by. One is your placement of the <coughs> fire commission under. The common council. Do you well so, see so that the mayor like taking no, the mayor out of it? That's really <laughs> the common council will hire the attorney for the PFC. And so that was more of a concept, really. Of uh, well, where where are we going to put these on the charts so people know that they exist? Yeah. Um, and under the idea that previously we had identified those as required or quasi judicial BCCs. Um, that uh, are created either in statutes or in our ordinances. Um, and so putting those under the Common Council because the Common Council creates the ordinances, theoretically, obviously, has to follow the statute. So it wasn't so much that this would be a reporting structure for purposes of the Common Council column, just that, you know, if we're going to think about these logically, we did not, we did not put it into a, a, an org chart with the lines and things, just trying to sort yeah. of 
figure out there. But no, I did not anticipate the PFC reporting to the company. Well, well, you then, write, write us a <laughs> paper on that. <laughs> so it's 124. We said we're going to stop at six minutes. Um, I just had one other comment about this that mm -hmm. I want on the record for this, and that is, um, and this is um, sort of foreshadowing our meeting tomorrow with the Common Council. It's intriguing when I, like, let the concept of all of these committees under CCE sink in. This is sort of uh, describing a situation in which leadership on the council is more distributed uh, in the body of the common council as opposed to really concentrated in the person of the president. Tomorrow, uh, the CCE, the common council, at the common council committee, I or another alder will report that there has been a revival of the proposal to make the president a two-year term on its own before the recommendations of this committee come out. So there's this is a topic that I hope we can get into in more detail about the uh, concentration of power in the person of the president versus uh, distribution of power in the CCEC and what that would mean for um, boards, commissions, and committees. Yeah, all interesting. I mean, the... Um Couple just, I mean, <clears throat> coming from doing environmental mitigation in states that are not amenable to it, my religion is pragmatism, probably to a fault in a way. And I'd say all that. I mean, I have issues with the epistemological origin of a lot of these things. I think you do have a very effective education committee. It's called your plan commission, and if you look at things that are actually affecting the capacity of children to learn. It is not the education committee, and it's not the school district or the school board. It's a number of other policies that are governed by a number of other things. Um, so that's like another function, you know, but it's like it gets into this. What I was saying about pragmatism is at some point we do have to write up something. And as we can pretend, <coughs> that we, uh, we're in here doing God's work. I don't know that the council or anyone else is going to see it that way if we bring them back recommendations that they do not like. So uh, if there are things, I mean, if, so thinking about what Eric was saying about representation, how do we express that in a way, you know, politically? Because this is what we are going to be advocating is for policy change. I am, you know, the, you know, we can we can make this or we can make this thing look like a dodecahedron or whatever. The likelihood of the council and the mayor. I mean, I'm just trying to think about the political reality of eliminating committees. And I think that's something that needs to be done, and I'm on that camp, and I think it's a necessity. I think it's ridiculous. Uh, how do we get? How do we make that path? And I don't know that this subcommittee has to answer that question, but I think if there are things that we are recognizing as being, whether they're unethical or immoral or disgusting or something that we don't sit right with, that we have recognized, how do we make sure that we no matter what, how do we get to that point where we can say that no matter what, we need to get this thing brought to the highest level? I think where we're looking, where you have a very small number of aldermanic districts, which I already have a problem with, but recognizing that we have a very small a number of aldermanic districts that have enormous influence on city policy, and that that's skewed, and if you look at it by racial uh, representation, it's even worse. That to me is something that I felt like was a fall off the chair moment and how do we address that? And what is the best way to ensure whether it's through this policy or through the press or how do we get that to the right attention so that we no matter what see changes in this thing? And I, uh, so let's answer that in 120 seconds and then, uh, but I do want us to, you know, as we go forward for our, again, penultimate as it's scheduled uh, subcommittee meeting to think about because well, I think what I think I can guarantee at the task force, we are not going to have unanimity on recommendations. And I think what we're going to end up having, what we need to be responsible about, is to be clear about the ideological underpinnings and or the power consequences of whatever option. So that when it goes to the council, like task force isn't, <coughs> we're not implementing this, but they the council will have options to vote on. That it's made very clear to the public and the council what the power consequences are of the decisions they make. And in some ways, maybe I don't want them to understand them. 
because if I'm trying to take away their power, I don't think that they'll ever buy that. <laughs> so I want to make sure they don't really understand the power dynamics because, no, I'm just saying that there is, this is, but I totally agree with you. I mean, I, I, I mean, I completely Proclaim agree. Proclaim your independent republic of Commonwealth development. <laughs> no, just, just okay. wherever, wherever I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean. Uh, but we need to do, we need to do that. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. I mean, this is uh, California stuff. You know how you ever been to California when they're on election? They publish like a novel. You get like a novel nailed to your house. It goes through every one of the... Um, any announcements? I, if there's everyone all right with pausing right now? I think we just have a lot that we're thinking about. I try to capture as much of this as possible so I can send it to John. He's going to turn everything we just said into haiku. It's going to be 17. What was that word you were going to make that orange chat look back at the... Uh, what was it? I don't know what one looks like, so I'd like to see it. Uh, it's three dimensional. Decided. Next time, let's bring some color boards, some color uh, paper okay. board. <laughs> Knock that guy out. Um, uh, okay, so we're we're at a stopping point right now. Um, I guess just out of recognizing you guys are here, I don't know if there's any commentary or observations or uh, and to Brenda also, and you know anything you're seeing that we're missing. Any questions that you might have? Um, I'd like to hold off my comments until I can actually get appointed to the task force. Okay. All right. Well. Of mystery. No, I've been I've been I'm being appointed to the task force to yeah, replace some of the vacancy, and so I don't want to. Well, I mean, but I don't want to give too many opinions until I feel like I have some authority. Well, one of the things that we tried. I mean, we've been uh, doing in general is the, the idea of the suspension of Roberts' rule, so that we can get commentary folks who, uh, who do take their time out to come in here so well. Uh, I appreciate that. However, I would just underscore the importance of the selection process and where that power and authority lies, I think is critical when you're talking about representation, for example. Just thank you for your open format, but it's helpful if the handouts and stuff are available online in advance. Fair enough. And copies are available for the public. So, so maybe, um, John, if you could add, like, on the agendas for all the meetings, add that link to that yeah, file. Um, oh, yeah, I guess it is. They, it's they are there. It's at the top of It's at the top of every agenda. Right. So it's not linked to the item. But the draft but wasn't. That draft oh, the draft wasn't beforehand? The dra oh, this. Yeah. Well, that, that's true. Because I, I wasn't sure, and I didn't hear, hear back from anybody if they wanted. I just okay. usually last comment. some confirmation about putting stuff in. Last comment was just going to be, I mean, and we got Brenda here, so um, maybe people can, can access it that way. But I, I, I would say for sure, moving forward, having, I would say at a minimum, having audio recordings available for all committees and commissions beyond simply just the notes of whatever actions were taken. I think we are, we are at a place with technology that that should be a, a a requirement so maybe this office of you know clerical support or whatever like that that maybe could happen through that but I would really put that because in terms of public participation if you can come to a meeting every once in a while but if you can follow along later either by watching the video or listening to the audio I think that's that's really critical so. what were we talking about this we were talking about this in the council subcommittee mm -hmm. about like it's kind of antiquated yeah that you can't access what happened there if you weren't actually there so all right, at this uh, time, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All right, uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor can leave. Aye. Aye. Opposed, stick around.